Assalamu alaikum and welcome uh, back again after the uh, exam week and after the great return march. Hopefully everyone is, uh, is doing well, you and your families. Uh, let's go back to the journey, our journey into English literature. And before I begin with uh, Bunyan, Dryden and Satire today, I need to remind you about what we did last time. Remember last the week before yes. the exam, we were speaking about the Lovely. Commonwealth, Lovely. the Restoration, and we came to John Milton, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and Samson Agonists. The uh, events for Samson Agonists took place in Gaza, around here, near here, which makes it really fantastic if anyone of you is interested in doing more reading, more research, or a presentation uh, on uh, Samson. I spoke about the Philistines and yes. Delilah, and the representation, the portrayal of the Palestinians living there, and how that could be helpful in a way or another. Today, we'll move to another author, similar in a way to Bunyan, to, to Milton, but a little bit different. His name is John Bunyan. Listen, when we start any age, we try to speak about the features of the age. Yes. We say this particular age has these particular features. But it doesn't mean mechanically every author, every poet, every novelist, every playwright in this age applies the same, very same features and characteristics or follows the same rules. For example, we've seen how John Donne breaks the, the rules of decorum and rebels against them in a way or another. In this age, we speak about, for example, how English literature was growing and was being modernized, new genres and everything. But when we speak about John Bunyan and his famous text, The Pilgrim's Progress, we go back to the medieval times of English literature. And even the name, look at the name, The Pilgrim's Progress. It's similar, it sounds like the Canterbury Tales, right? Yes. It sounds like a other text we studied in Old English, maybe the Dream of the Rood, we'll uh, yeah. probably mention this in, in a bit. So this is a text that is, in a way, purely religious. Yes. It doesn't follow the political themes we spoke about in Marvel, even in Milton sometimes. Completely religious uh, topic, religious uh, theme, religious subject matter. This is a significant text in England in particular. Many people consider the Pilgrim's Progress to be second only to the Bible itself. It's so close to the Bible that even now, in churches in England, they take extracts, stanzas, poetry, and they sing uh, uh, regularly, you know, psalms or hymns in the, in the church from this book. Many people think it is even a religious book written by one saint or something. But it's actually a literature book. The pilgrims, you know what pilgrim is? Someone who goes into a religious Please. journey, right? So the pilgrim's uh, progress is an allegory. And when we speak about allegories, we go also back to the medieval drama. We said medieval drama was basically religious, basically stories from the Bible basically uh, allegorical stories, where the main characters are biblical and religious characters. So sometimes, it could be funny now, but this is what happened. And the same thing is being repeated by John Bunyan in around uh, uh, 1678 and later on. In the past, in the medieval drama, the main characters would be named after the virtues or the vices. So someone would be named Charity, and someone would be named uh, jealousy. Someone would be named greed. And then at the end of the play, uh, jealousy is beaten or greed is, you know, punched in the face and uh, charity wins, teaching you religious and moral lessons that charity, uh, not in this simplistic way, but more moralist. The main character in the Pilgrim's Progress is named Christian. Christian, Christian because he is a, a religious person. He's a Christian. He is a Christian. And he goes into all sorts of difficult journeys, facing 
for example, the giant despair. If you look at the book, for example, page uh, 61, there is this giant despair. Despair is an idea, an abstract concept, right? Despair, when you give up hope. But here it is characterized, it is presented to us as a human, as a person, in order to create this kind of allegory. The allegory of a Christian person who faces all sorts of difficulties. And because he's good, because he follows the teachings of Christ, of God, he wins, he wins at the end, and that's it. So simply speaking, the text is about the religious values, about seeking stability, about following, uh, about criticizing. Of course, when you are calling for uh, religious values and emphasizing the Christian faith in God, what you should be, okay? In a way, you're also criticizing the society. So this, in, the, in, in, in a sense, the text is political in this regard because it, it is suggesting that the society we're living in is corrupt, purely corrupt, because of the politics, because of the division. And the only way out of this is to go back to the Christian values. So this is a pilgrim's progress model. We're not going to take extracts, but again, every time you are interested in knowing more, you just Google the text or go to, you, go to YouTube and you can uh, uh, read more extracts and listen to people recite them. Really interesting stuff. So. What else does it use uh, to, to resemble medieval literature? Number one, the allegory. Allegory, remember, again, allegory doesn't mean necessarily old or ancient literature, but in the past, many writers and authors would use allegory to make an idea clear and simplify something. Even now, we use this, but generally we use it to talk to kids, to write. Uh, stuff for children. But it doesn't mean this is simplistic. It could be very profound. So, the allegory. The other technique is the dream, dream vision. vision. Like the, the, the dream, dream of the root world. itself. Yes. It's typical dream of, of the root. It also takes from the medieval features of naming the characters after the thing they, uh, they, they abide by or something. So, there's Christian, and there's the giant despair, and there's Vanity Fair also that he has to, to come. What is the theme? It's generally about the emphasizing the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. While doing this, the text is criticizing and questioning the values of modern life. What is the book suggesting? Suggesting the only way out of this corruption and political division and restlessness is going back to the, uh, the uh, Christian uh, values, original Christian values. And in the book, there is an extract. Could you please go to 62. 62, yeah. There is an extract. Can someone read? And listen, it says here, some of Banyan words are still sung today in British churches. So it's not only the Bible, but the religious text, poetry, is sung there. Someone read, there is no discouragement. OK. He wants to be a pilgrim. He wants to go to God to achieve the Christian, to reach the, the Christian values. No obstacle, no barrier can prevent him because he already has the intention. He has the intent, the avowed intent to be a pilgrim, to be a pilgrim. So this is basically what we need to know for this course about, about Banyan. Uh, the other thing is going again back here, satire. What is satire? We spoke about this before in brief. What is it? How do you define it? Satire. It's one of the few literary devices we saw. We, we had cesura, remember? Alliteration. Alliteration, irony, satire, Piers Plowman, William Langland, remember? What is satire? How would you define it? What does it mean? You don't have to give me a perfect definition. Is it new to you? Is satire new to you? Have you heard of it before? No. I heard of it, no? I heard of it but I don't know the exact meaning. It doesn't have to be exact. What do you think, of, what do, what do you, think it means? In what I context? Think, I think it means when you say something. Uh, I don't know. That's irony. Yeah, irony. 
the no, thing, no. you say there's something and you mean the opposite, you expect something and the opposite happens. Generally, this is irony. Irony. Yes. Like, oh, poor philosopher, he only has a little gold in his coffer. But a little gold means a lot of money, so this is ironic. <coughs> Satire, basically, in Arabic, it's hija. And I have to give you the Arabic meaning because we know this. Uh, in, Ara in Arabic literature, in Arabic poetry, we have a lot of hija, a lot of satire. So a satirical text, satire is, it could be a genre, a type of poetry or literature, or it could be a literary device. It could be part of a text, or the whole text could be satire, where the author criticizes, attacks either people or things values, behavior, society. events, the society itself. So that is satire. In Arabic literature, we study this all the time because there's this a lot of praise. The Arab poets loved always to praise their tribes and to brag about their achievements and how heroic they are. And they sometimes would attack their opponents, satirize them, criticize them defame them. And this is satire. It was there in the Arabic poetry centuries ago. It is still there now. And it started to appear more and more here in England, in England, in London mainly, because of the political division. Remember, in the past, we had one enemy, an external enemy, threatening the peace and the stability of the whole country. So poetry would be mostly heroic against the invaders, the epic poems, like Bewol, for example. Who's the enemy? And, and a external, someone oh. from outside. outside. An outsider who threatens the stability. But now there is a stability, and the king was executed, and the Commonwealth, Cromwell, and then his son was removed, and the king was restored, and another king was removed peacefully, so there was a lot of political division. The king started to lose power, and the government, the, uh, the parliament became more powerful. And if there is, again, politics, election, right? Yes. There's always competition, conflict. And of course, literature will react or would be part of this. So people would be attacking each other. Like, we saw this in the Arabic, uh, cult, uh, like uh, in our Arabic heritage and culture. Generally, if the enemy is an outsider, everyone would be uniting against them. But when there is no threat from outside, they, they would fight in, inside. Exactly, and it happens. Like I, I had one professor when I was doing my MA in London, who said, generally, in, in the, this is not a conspiracy theory. It happens in a way or another. The Western countries, always the imperialist countries, they always seek an external enemy in order to create stability inside, to unite the people on something. It's happening in Israel, for example. If we don't, if they don't have us, the Palestinian, the native Palestinian as the enemy of everyone, they would be fighting among themselves. So to create some kind of unity, someone has to, come and someone has to be the enemy, and we are the enemy. They, they use us to spook as the, you know, the monster. Oh. So let's unite against this. It happens uh, everywhere. So satire, like in Arabic, again, became a thing here. And when we speak about satire in Arabic, we speak about sometimes the caliph himself, the ruler, would take care of these uh, poets who would spend a lot of time attacking each other. Some critics believe that in Arabic culture, the rulers wanted this because, number one, it, it's going to distract people. You know, distract? Yeah. Instead of paying attention to corruption and politics, so you are busy insulting each other. To the extent that there were competitions. I'm, I'm sure you studied Jarir or Farazdaq or Akhtal. Yes. There were always uh, these, you know, uh, poetic battles between these. And in one, one competition, I'm sure you. You heard of it before. Uh, they wanted to hear the, the, um, the strongest line of poetry in terms of satire and praise and 
and, and was I think uh, Al-Akhtal started saying that, uh, bragging, you know, about himself and his ability. He's saying, he was saying, "Anal Qutran was shu'ara ujarba, wa fil Qutran ilil jarba shifa." You know, Qutran tar. In the past, when a camel would uh, have this uh, disease, they would put tar, qutran, so it doesn't infect other animals. Uh, so he's saying, "Ana al qutran wa shu'ara wa jarba, wa fil qutran wa fil jarba wa fil qutran ilil jarba shifa." Ana al I heal you. I'm more powerful than you. Oh, strong. And then the first was like, "Fa intaku dha rahila fa inni ana ta'oon wa laysa lahu shifa." If your disease can be healed by tar or by anything, I am, I am the plague, the black, you know, black death yes. of plague. And a ta'um It was Jarir uh, who had to say something the last, and we know Jarir always wins. And he was like, "Ana al-mawtu al-ladhi ati alaykum, falaysa liharibin minhu najah." This is, in part, you're praising yourself, but you are also attacking, criticizing, satirizing the, your opponent. Yeah, and we've seen this everywhere. We've seen Antara do this all, all the time. There are two types, generally two types of, of satire. Number one, general, where you criticize things in general. Like, okay, I hate the society. The society is not good. It's bad that people are you know, spending much time online or people are hypocrites. They think, they tell you they like you, but they stab you in the back. This is generally without naming names, without naming events or specific situations. And there is open, personal, and direct. Like where in the text you have someone named. Someone That's in direct. name or an event. Like a particular situation, a particular person, a particular political party, you name them. This is direct and personal. In both types, we have implicit or explicit. Like, you read the line and you say, yeah, why is he attacking this? But sometimes you, sometimes you read the line and there is what we call subtle. You know subtle, not subtle. <laughs> subtle, with a silent T. Subtle means implied, not everyone can see or understand. Hidden. Hidden. Uh, do you know al uh, Hutayya? He's an Arab, but he's probably the most famous satirist in the Arabic literature. He satirized everything. He attacked everybody. He criticized everybody, even his wife. Everyone he sees, you just attack him. So his wife left him, naturally. And there was no one at home. And I, they, it is said that he had a mirror. And then he looked in the mirror. And when he saw himself, he criticized himself. <laughs> It is said that some people doubt the story. This is not a true story. That uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one person of the Prophet's companion came to Abu Khattab and said, this man satirized me. He attacked me. He's insulting me. He said, because Omar wants to hear the other side. So what did he say? He said, al-makarim la tarhal li bughiyatiha waqud fa innaka anta al-ta'im al-kasi. Umar al-Khattab, no, it's not a true story because Umar al-Khattab should understand this because he knows. But it's not a big deal here. The story is significant. Umar al-Khattab said, I don't know if that's a joke. 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 Someone else was sitting there, a poet probably, and he said, لقد سلخه سلخا. يعني يعني مش بس هجاء. He almost killed him. And unskinned him or, you know, deboned him like in a way that brutal. Why? Because it's not clear, it's subtle satire. The poet used ta'im kasi bimana mat'oom maksi. Bimana nunta kol wushrabuna. Your job is just to eat and to sleep. Don't go after great things. You don't deserve them. You can't have them. Just stay at home eat and drink and sleep. Sometimes it's subtle poetry like this that makes satire really powerful. So again, whether personal or impersonal, again, personal or impersonal, general, public, or specific, individual, or subtle, meaning implied. You know implied? Not anyone can understand it. Or explicit. Satire 
was an important genre, became an important genre in the 17th and 18th century. The most important satirist is John Dryden, but we're going to study another poet before him. His name is John Wilmot. So many Johns, right? Yes. Okay. Focus on the second name always. If you can't remember in the exam the first name, it's not a problem. Just go for the second name. So his text is a satire against mankind. Without reading the text, the title of the poem suggests that this is impersonal general where he is attacking not one person in particular. He's attacking the whole society. And indeed, he was against, he was attacking, uh, criticizing the academia, the politics, the church, religion, uh, people, poli everything. The whole society. And this is an extract, a really interesting extract. But notice in the book it says, I'd be a god. Yeah, but here the original text, I think it says a dog, because it fits more. Because dog, monkey, dog, monkey and bear. Someone read, please. I'd be a dog, a monkey, or a peer, or anything but... Bear. Bear, bear yes. Mm or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. Very good, yeah. I'd be a dog, a monkey, or a bear. Bear. Bear, uh, or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. Of being rational, yeah, please. I'd be a dog, a monkey, or a bear. 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 Bear, and it's the dog at the bear. Bear. Who is so proud of being rational. Who? Okay, so who is he criticizing? Who is the vain animal? He criticizing all mankind. Mankind. The title suggests this, but in the poem here, he says, I'd rather be an animal. You know, an animal that doesn't talk, communicate, understand, doesn't have an intellectual, not, not, not rational, but not this vain animal. Vain means too proud. Uh, so a man who's like too proud of himself, a show off, who is proud, who's so proud of being rational, because man is worse, in his opinion, than an animal. an animal, than a dog or a monkey or a bear. This is satire, but satire not against you or yeah. you or me, it's against mankind in general. This is called impersonal satire. Okay? What is the rhyme scheme? A, B, 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 B. A, B, B. A, B, B. True. So how would you comment on this? Say, this extract is by John, John, John Wilmot. Wilmot. From the text, A Satire, a satire, against, a satire mankind. against Mankind. In this text, the poet is criticizing mankind, humanity in general, in general human beings in general. In his opinion, he prefers to be. He prefers to be. Animal. It's better to be an animal, a dog, a monkey, or a bear, rather than a human being, because human humans are corrupt, vain, and too proud of themselves. That's simple. Does it reflect the age? Yes. Yeah, because a society with political division and infighting creates satire, creates bad behavior and bad reaction. The most important person we have here is John Dryden. I think I mentioned John Dryden yes, before. John yeah, and we will go back probably later on to him. John Dryden is one of the four people who satirized John Donne, who attacked John Donne, who didn't consider John Donne a poet, because this man follows the rules of decorum, neoclassicism, classical rules of decorum, and John Donne didn't. So John Dryden, who, by the way, lived during the Commonwealth yes. and was considered the po poet laureate. You know poet laureate? Laureate. laureate? Poet laureate, like some kind of prince of poet. Yes. Prince of poets. Yes. Yeah, but if, when someone dies, someone follows. That's the story. So we don't only have one prince of poets or poet laureate. When someone dies, so during the Commonwealth, he wrote poetry praising Oliver Cromwell. 
When Oliver Cromwell died, his son was removed. The king was restored. He also wrote poetry praising the king. And it's funny, this is what poets do sometimes. It doesn't mean their poetry is not important, significant, if they do this. But sometimes they want someone to support them financially and to provide them with protection. Uh, you studied the Mutanabi, the greatest Arab poet. He wrote the best poetry praising Kafur al Ikhshidi when he left uh, Aleppo, uh, Sayf al Dawla, and he went to Egypt expecting to be given some place to rule. When he wasn't given that, he wrote also one of his best poems ever, satirizing and attacking Kafur al Ikhshidi. It's the same poem, the famous poem, Eidun bi ayat halin. It's a satire poem in, in a way or another because he attacks uh, the Egyptians of, the, of that time, the uh, Kafur al Ikhsidi and his people. So poets sometimes want to go with, with the, the, the current. Not all of them, but some of them. It doesn't make their poetry less important or less uh, significant. So he lost his position as the poet laureate because when the king was restored, things were different. He wrote several uh, texts. One of them is Absalom and Ashtophel. Don't confuse this with uh, Ashtophel and Stella. Okay? By Spencer or Spencer, right? Yes, the. Not, not Spencer. Spencer? Sir Philip Sidney. Sir Philip Sidney. Okay, read this. Someone else, please. Oh, someone else, sorry. Sorry. I want to make you all participate. Yes. Plots, true or false, are necessary things to raise up commonwealths and to ru and ruin kings. To ruin kings. Someone else, please. Plots, true or false, are necessary things uh, to raise up commonwealths. To raise. To raise up commonwealths and to uh, ruin kings. To ruin kings. Before we comment on this, look at the perfect yeah. prime yeah. scheme. A A. It's a couplet. Yes. Is it a couplet? Yeah. Let's check. How many syllables? Syllables are not the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But it's not ruin, ruin, ruin two syllables. Ruin. And it's about one idea. So this is a perfect couplet. But again, this is dry tip. He sticks to the number of, of syllables. What are plots? We, I think we mentioned up the word plot before. Plot means um, in a literary work. The, what's in a, in a paragraph? The plot, the setting. In a story. Yeah, in a story. The plot is the way the events are arranged in a particular yeah, story. So first he wakes up, then he goes back, and then he well, dreams about sure. something, and then he remembers something, and then he goes, and then he meets somebody, and then they get married, and they have kids, and they live happily ever after. This is the plot. The, the arrangement of the event in a story. Mm -hmm. But plots here is totally different. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about literature. He's not, yeah. yeah. A plot, if I plot against you, I want to do something a devilish plan so you fail or so I become you know more important than you so you oh, people think you are person. to plot against someone to scheme to plan to plan something negative generally like you know mu'amara like a conspire like to conspire against someone so plots here are like mu'amara what are you plotting like some you, you, you come and your friends are like whispering and say what are you plotting like, what are you planning to do without me or something? So, plots, true, true or false, like politics. Yes. Yes. True or false are necessary things. The means, the end justifies the means here. The means yes. is justified by the end. Why? To raise up commonwealths. The very term commonwealth is there. Political satire. To raise up commonwealths and ruin kings. Is he being sarcastic? I can't tell here. We don't have enough uh, context. But this is some kind of satire. An attack against the political situation, the, the political plotting. It's not clear to me in this couplet. That he wants to ruin the king. Maybe he's attacking the Commonwealth. Both. Or both. But 
there's clear attack satire against the political situation of his time, a situation that instead of improving the society, we have plotting against each other. In a way, this is more uh, specific than Wilmot. Wilmot, mankind. And this one, he chooses politics and politicians. Next, another text by someone read and tell me what you think. I don't want to comment first. Yeah, someone read first, yeah, please. Deviates into? Uh, into Very good. More? Yes, please. Chema. OK, very good. What do you think? What kind of satire is this? What is he saying? I think it's like a competition between him and another poet. A poet. OK, so there is a name of a person. Shadwell. Shadwell. Is this personal or impersonal? Specific or general? Direct. 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 Specific. He mentions the name of his rival. Yeah. Shadwell is said to be a, a literary rival of, of Dryden. And remember, Dryden came after John Donne. But for him, John Donne and his school was some kind of a, a rival. So he attacked him. He trashed him. What is he saying? Yeah. He's saying, I think, he's saying that uh, his work doesn't make sense. Whose work? Uh, okay. The rest, to some faint meaning. Faint also here means some kind of subtle implied. Mm -hmm. Like you could make sense sometimes, even if it is faint. Way. But Shadwell never, it could be, by the way, never makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Shadwell Even never that. makes sense. All his poetry is nonsensical, trash bad. But he doesn't say it this way. He's more like, like critical, satirical. The satire is very sharp. Okay. I think it's more, it's more subtle because he doesn't say things directly. Okay. So there is maybe the rest of poets. Yeah. Like there are bad poets. Maybe some of them sometimes, sometimes, even a bad poet sometimes can say good things, right? We're not poets. Yeah, maybe some of you are, but we're not poets. If we write a hundred poems, maybe one or two or three poems or three lines would be good. Yeah. Because when you write more, you will eventually say something good. So some might give faint meaning, make sense sometimes. But Chadwell never ever makes sense, sense, not even by mistake. OK? See what I mean here? Yeah. So it's not that he never makes sense. He never makes sense, not even by mistake. He never, you know, deviate. Yeah. Yes. Like mm -hmm. his poetry is always bad. But doesn't he sometimes, by mistake, write good poetry? Even that, no. And this is very no, sharp. sharp. Very sharp. Like you would never do a thing. Because if you write poetry, I said this. If you write poetry, a lot of poetry, even if you are a bad poet, maybe you will say something good. But Shadwell? He will not be. And he will not be. Even by mistake, he never deviates into, <laughs> into common sense. Is this personal or not? Yes. The name is there. The text is Mac, Mac Flacno. Very strange Did name. Did Shadwell reply? Sorry? Did Shadwell reply? I, I'll have to check. I think if Interesting. If someone told me these words, I would never write again. <laughs> Yeah, or you would write more. Yeah, so because this kind of, oh, okay, you're attacking me, you're choosing you this, me. I'll show that I write better about it than you. It is. Yeah. yeah, some people when attacked, oh, you write trash, this is bad writing, you would give up. But some people would take this as a challenge. Yeah. Yes. So how can Shadwell prove that he writes better? By writing more and responding to him. And that's why we have more literature. Remember again, always remember the first dog for anterior. Maybe he, sh he could uh, write poems to a king or a queen to impress them and maybe. to be famous. Maybe. Yeah. Did you count the syllables? Is this uh, a couplet? 
It's yeah. imperfect. Perfect tense, sense. Yes. Yes. Perfect rhyme. Yeah. Yeah. It's not about the letter, it's about a sound. And don't be tricked by how long and how short yeah. this is. The count the syllables. Ten, ten. Again, dry them. Perfect. We will not find this generally in Dan because Dan doesn't care about the number of syllables. He just he cares more about the idea. And finally, uh, another text by. Listen, Dryden was again was a famous poet, a famous dramatist, and also a famous critic. Hopefully, you study him next uh, year as a critic, a literary critic. You know, literary critic. Naqd Adabi, literary criticism, etc. In one of his final poems, it's called the Secular Mask. Mask reminds us of the Mask of Queens by. Benjamin. And it's mask, not mosque. It's not mosque or mosquito. <laughs> mask because mask. Okay? Secular, the opposite of religious, probably. The poem was written, interestingly, the last year of the 18th. Uh, what is it? One, can you check? Can you double check? The last year, yeah, it's uh, 1700, the last year of the 17th century. It ends the whole century. It wraps things up. It's like people like, okay, two minutes, and the whole century will be up. And he says, wait a minute, I have a poem. And he writes a poem in a way or another to wrap up the whole Everything. age. Yes. He's addressing who generally? Wars. Wars. Thy wars. Bad. Thy meaning? You. You. Your. Thy. Your. Your wars. Whose wars? The whole century. The whole 17th century, the whole age. Thy wars brought nothing about. Thy lovers were all untrue, fake. Tis, tis, it is, right? Tis well an old age is out. And time to begin anew. Enough of this age. Enough of this. We have had too much. And I think we should begin a new life and turn not a new leaf, a new page, but a new, a new book. book, a new way of life. The way wars brought nothing about. It brought death and destruction and corruption, but right? Nothing good and, no, but nothing managed. about this. We didn't benefit. And even thy lovers, the poets, the writers, the authors, they were all fake. No one is genuine. It is well an old age is out. It's an age that is dying. We have had enough of this. So the best thing to do is to begin a new one. And time to begin a new Interesting and easy. Is it difficult to understand? No. Oh. So, if, can you check the rhyme scheme? Abby, Abby. Abby. Did you count the syllables? Seven. Six. Seven. Seven. All seven. When, okay, how? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here it should be, it is. Oh, yeah. Tis. And uh, here one, tis. It is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. seven. And again, remember, Dryden always sticks to the rules. So generally speaking, this is uh, the end of the restoration. A very interesting age in many ways. Uh, does anyone have any questions, please? Do you have questions? Yes. Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, and for the next class, listen. We're taking this, this is off. Restoration drama is off. Yeah, we're going to begin with the Augustan age, the rise of the novel.
So we're jumping to page 77. And thank you very much. If you have questions, please take.